Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, a podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm an investigative journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are economists, scientists, politicians, academics and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and ecological crises that we face today. And they reveal their solutions to mitigate the damage to our future. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. This week, I spoke with physicist and engineer Yi Tao, who's working on a geoengineering solution to tackle global warming, specifically the amount of thermal energy and heat that is raining down on the planet every day from the sun. Yi and his colleagues proposed to put in place mirrors over 10% of the world's cropland and they say simply by doing that, we can stabilize the planet's climate for another century. Now, this is like <laughs> very much an engineering uh, episode. And I do apologize if anybody's an engineer and I've completely dumbed it down for you. Um, Yi has all the figures and statistics and the terawatts and all of that stuff um, to explain how these mirrors can positively impact the climate and energy, et cetera, et cetera. I come back and ask all the questions about the impact on ecosystems um, and water and even, you know, the concept of geoengineering. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Now, what I really, really loved uh, hearing in everything that Yi had to say is that him and his team fundamentally understand that geoengineering can only be a part of the solution, um, that it's a short term solution to combat the major issues that we face that are going to upend billions of lives all over the world in the coming decades. And that is why uh, him and his team have decided to do this as an open source project. They, they were a part of Harvard, the Roland Institute, and they have been approached by huge funders that have offered all the money necessary. And he and his colleagues have turned this down. That means all of their research is out there. It's available for other scientists. They're trying to collaborate with scientists and with labs. Uh, all over the USA. And, and it even means that they're delving into their own pockets to fund part of this research. I personally think that that's um, even more exciting than the mirrors, hearing about scientists and academics who have so firmly infused their method and their research with a strict code of ethics to combat the bigger picture that has driven the climate crisis is just phenomenal. So whether you're here for the social stuff or whether you're here for the engineering stuff, this episode has both and I really, really hope you enjoy it. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you love it though, do consider supporting Planet Critical on Patreon. The transcripts of each interview are now available for Planet Critical patrons. The link is in the description box below and a huge thanks to everyone who's already supporting the project. Thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It was your colleague that reached out and said that I had to interview you about this this project that you're working on. Oh, it must be like uh, Peter, I guess, right? Mm, can't remember, which is embarrassing, but I'm sure he's listening. Thank you. Um, so can you dive into it a little bit more and explicate it a little bit and maybe your background as well? Because I read over some of the papers when we initially set up this interview uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, yeah, I, I ne definitely need it explained. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically my background is a um, um, physicist, experimental physicist with uh, also training uh, throughout my undergrad years in chemistry, biochemistry. So it sort of have a more interdisciplinary background compared to uh, the traditional academic. I think I was in college, you know, in the 2000s. So that's uh, when this uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary training became a thing. So I sort of also uh, took some advice from mentors to really change field in between uh, college and PhD and really, you know, did something that's completely different. Um, so, but my core expertise is in um, physical instrumentation design building and also the analysis of uh, mechanisms uh, at a uh, small scale, but it turns out that uh, basically the same physics, same chemistry applied even at planetary scales. So there's some very simple recurrent uh, uh, patterns that occur that's mm -hmm. scale invariant. Right. Okay. I mean, that would make sense if you think about the laws of physics. <laughs> so, and now you're at, you're at Harvard, right? You're working on this, on this Mears project. No, actually my uh, contract with Harvard uh, ended uh, uh, September, 2021. Mm. So I was hired for a, a fixed term for five years to do something that's not climate related was to build a, a microscope uh, that's a hybrid between MRI and atomic force microscope. 
So the goal is to be able to take uh, atomic resolution images in 3D of small specks of matter, such as viral particles or uh, molecule drug complexes or oh, wow. individual uh, transistor chips or just a single device. And the reason why such a microscope would be very useful is uh, generally uh, the structure of things uh, define their function. And that's true for the human body, the, all the way down to individual devices and also the uh, interior you know, design of the house and et cetera, et cetera. So that's why um, being able to uh, understand the, the comp composition and structure of small things, uh, which we cannot really see using conventional methods of optical microscopy is very important. Uh, in trying to understand how small things work. For example, the COVID virus. Mm, mm. And did you succeed? Did you build the microscope? Uh, we made, you know, incremental steps towards such a microscope. <laughs> uh, such a thing requires, you find out that you're trying to, you know, build uh, the sensors and then to build the, the sensors for this experiment, you need to build uh, additional instruments to make the sensors. Um, so it's uh, it's iterative. So, so the thing just, uh, you know, expands to several projects. But we... In the process of this, uh, trying to uh, achieve a, a grand goal, we were able to uh, develop new engineering and new science. Uh, so, for example, we were able to make the world's uh, strongest uh, oxide magnet thin film. And we were also uh, able to demonstrate the most precise machining uh, that people have demonstrated, basically with atomic uh, depth resolution. Okay. And uh, uh, we also made uh, some uh, mechanical sensors that have unprecedented uh, force sensitivities and the frequency performances. Uh, so basically, the project was on track, to, you know, to meeting uh, the targets of uh, exponential increase in sensitivity, you know, by the middle of the 2020s. And that's on, you know, but in 2018, uh, 2017, I realized that, oops, that's basically the... <laughs> a date where impacts of climate change would become so dramatic that uh, civilization would have to realize that um, uh, it would be quite unlikely that we'll be able to continue this way of life and mm. expect uh, continued progress in science and technology because the foundation um, for doing such grand things, basically um, the food, the resource, the political stability will likely uh, not be there anymore within the coming decade or two. So that's why um, we basically uh, slowed down uh, work on the nanoscience, but then uh, really turned it to analyzing the problem of uh, global climate and whether there's anything that we can actually do to make a, an impact to slow down the process or to hopefully fix it. So that, that project then developed like that at Harvard because of the awareness of the team of the, the in upcoming impact of climate change. Yes. So the becoming, uh, uh, becoming, you know, realizing the urgency is what motivated uh, me to pivot the resources of my group to start tackling this uh, this, this problem. And out of curiosity, um, how receptive were Harvard to that pivot? Uh, so my institute, the Ro the Roland Institute, uh, is uh, something that's not really embedded within the Harvard campus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually much closer to MIT uh, due to the history of uh, the Institute. And uh, we, like my position at the time, a Roland Fellow, we had a full opportunity to basically pursue whatever research that we deemed uh, in important. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, my uh, pivot in direction, like uh, two, three years into my five-year program, was uh, essentially would be judged as a career suicide. So it's not taken very uh, well by the administration, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, personally, I think, uh, the sacrifice, uh, it's not even something that one should consider given, uh, knowledge of what is actually happening to the climate. It's just a ethical, a moral imperative to really do the right thing. Are you seeing this trend on campuses at universities with researchers abandoning sort of their original projects to, to focus on, you know, this global crisis? Uh, certainly not. No, uh, most people are uh, so invested in their work um, that it's almost difficult for them to really sit down and have time to reflect on the larger picture. And also, academia is such a competitive place that if you lost focus, you know, even 
for brief periods, you might, you know, lose your ability to continue in the field. Yeah, definitely. I was speaking with David Orr earlier this week, actually, um, and he was discussing the the fact that society has become so atomized and fragmented and then you know the the problems that we see on campuses when education becomes atomized and fragmented and it's a theme that comes up quite a lot on this show the fact that it's incredible that educators don't cross the hallway or cross campuses to to speak to one another and to find out what's going on in other departments to kind of you know, create an aggregate of of research um <clears throat> but i still i still find it very very surprising every time i hear um, that the you know brightest people in the world with the access to the most resources are just as slow as the general public of coming to terms with how urgent the situation is. Yeah, I think the the basic problem is that the way resources is distributed, as you say. Mm. So uh, we have managed through uh, the capitalistic system and uh, the incentive structure uh, to make it uh, very exceedingly difficult. Uh, through any career to really to make uh, to, let's say, the top or a position where you really can have just the basics, uh, yeah. maybe a bit more beyond the basics so you can do something that really motivates you. And that's true for um, people working in factories as much as it for professors working in universities and also for the millions of artists, you know, who are trying to uh, be creative, but uh, the only the very few, arguably the, the, not the most artistically talented or deserving are being uh, promoted for financial gains. Mm -hmm. The whole systematic issue that manifests uh, across disciplines and in all walks of life. Yeah, it's the, um, oh, what is the word? This, this illusion of scarcity that kind of keeps everybody in place fighting, even though there's so many resources available and so much funding available. The fact that it's tapped out are limited um, to a hierarchy it means people keep having to fight over scraps, um, and it's funders that are decide. Even in education, it's funders that are deciding what gets studied and what doesn't. Really, very often, actually, researchers. Yes, basically, like uh, for most people, you know, let's think outside of uh, the Western world. Uh, in many places, the basic right to even to survive has been uh, deprived. So, like, and in the West. Um, like extrinsic motivations of power and status and popularity are essentially uh, uh, ways to get at, say, simply money. Or, and money is essentially the tool that can, in the very beginning, that uh, ensures, say, the right to, to survive and the right to reproduce, to reproduce. So I think that, that, that that's a, a problem. And uh, there needs to be uh, social engineering that happens to um, make and a decouple like power status and popularity for money mm, yeah that's interesting although i think i would if we if we had more time i think i'd like to debate the use of the term social engineering there <laughs> because i think it's like it's social engineering that's kind of gotten us into this stage so it's i don't know reverse engineering perhaps um but we we won't get semantic about it um Tell me then, before before we get into the nitty gritty of the project, what was the moment or the series of moments that made you decide to commit career suicide and focus on climate change? So I don't think that these are uh, very precise moments, uh, but rather a um, uh, you know, long process through maybe uh, 10, 15 years of my scientific education and also just uh, um, intuitively seeing how this sort of uh, uh, massive consumption um, it's not really uh, compatible with any uh, idea of, you know, a limited planet. Mm -hmm. And um, what really brings people uh, joy. Uh, like, personally, when I was uh, young, uh, I was uh, really drawn into science and um, just the pursuit of uh, knowledge, you know, from books in the good, some good TV shows back then, and also uh, the practice of uh, an instrument, um, you know, attaining the state of flow. These are Thing that really brought a deep joy uh, to me as, as a kid and a teenager. Um, and also um, being able to really just uh, have the chance to focus on one thing or a couple of things very deeply and devote your um, whole schedule to that purpose. The sense of um, um, uh, just flow and enjoyment and the purpose and the, the level of joy that that brought 
was really sort of inspirational to me. And uh, comparing that with some of my my peers, uh, uh, including ones that I um, met at Harvard as an undergrad, who um, somehow devoted their times to the pursuit of um, uh, financial means and gains uh, already at school, but then continued after um, their graduation. Many of them shared that they felt an intense sense of um, um, just lack of uh, accomplishment, or how should I put it? Um, just it's difficult to explain. Um, maybe we we'll come back to this later. Like unfulfilled. Yeah, they they feel highly unfulfilled and uncertain of uh, the meaning of life, and many of them became uh, deeply religious as a result oh, really? of the of the feeling, um, the lack of satisfaction hmm. um, when they fail to, um, uh, let's say, make uh, fifty percent gain in profit over their performance in the past year. And obviously, you, you know, this sort of exponential expectation of performing better and better year to year, that's just not realistic. Yeah. So they very soon run out of uh, the ability to uh, keep feeding uh, some sense of purpose or mm. or goal in life. Um, and was was this within, you know, the physics, biology, and chemistry departments? Uh, well, actually, at Harvard, most people, there's very few undergrads studying pure science and engineering, at least uh, back in the early 2000s. And uh, many of my classmates uh, who started out being really interested in um, chemistry, physics, uh, all went to investment banking uh, and uh, finance. Uh, <laughs> so Very good. Yeah. <laughs> what a good thing to do with your education. <laughs> it doesn't end there. You know, the, um, for many who did go into PhD uh, and the further studies, they could eventually also go to buy financial sectors, and yeah. also um, working for the military industrial complex. <laughs> yeah, it's all part of the same problem, isn't it? But this isn't this isn't meant to be like a, a, a sociological episode. We are meant to be discussing your your projects because, like, let let's get into it because what I saw, what I understood, I've read through that paper like three times, and I'm still not sure if it's a metaphor or if it's actually what you're proposing. Do you want to put mirrors on the surface of the planet? Uh, is that a metaphor? No, it's uh, actually what it wants. Uh, we we believe would be necessary uh, right. for the persistence of human life on this planet. And uh, the placement and where you put them needs to be very um, carefully um, chosen. So there are many um, locations where there would be a, a very overwhelming local benefit. Um, so these are hypotheses we're trying to test in field experiment. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, when you put mirror into a crop field, let's say, it uh, prevents a fraction of the light from being converted into thermal energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thermal energy that's usually absorbed by plants uh, need to be dissipated somehow, and plants do that by evaporating away water. Mm -hmm. So your water consumption is directly proportional to how much uh, sunlight and also near-infrared that gets absorbed. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So that's one piece of the clue. The other is uh, oftentimes uh, crops cannot make use of 100% of the solar ir irradiance that's given to them, especially in um, latitudes, lower latitudes, uh, where, there, uh, where there's uh, sometimes too much sun, you know, all through the year and too hot to perform agriculture. So putting mirrors strategically um, in, a, you know, a, geogra a geometrically well-designed um, patterns into crop fields can help to lower the amount of um, heat generated and giving overall a better light environment for the crops. Okay. So is this is this like a, a tool then for agribusiness as well as, you know, combating the effects of climate change? Or is there also a proposal to put mirrors in, um, you know, natural landscapes in order to purely combat climate change? We envision the project to, you know, uh, proceed through several stages. Uh, in the very initial stage, it should bring overwhelming local benefits to uh, the farmers uh, who are, you know, at the front line of climate change. Mm -hmm. So uh, the strong local cooling, it would be like an incentive um, for a, a grassroots type of uh, adaptation of the technology. When it's at small scale, there is no risk of um, 
disturbing uh, planetary climate. So it's very nice that people are able to do these experiments and really test out the, um, the problems that, that can arrive, uh, arise. For example, uh, are there impacts on local birds? Are there impacts mm. on local insect biomass? Mm -hmm. so these are uh, scientific questions that can be readily tested without having to worry about um, uh, the global impact on the small scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, once those are worked out, and if like a positive impact can be demonstrated, then there will be incentive by agribusiness, by uh, wine makers in Spain and, and mm -hmm. France who are struggling to maintain production to mm -hmm. perhaps use these technologies uh, more broadly. And when um, adaptation is at a global level, let's say 10% of cropland uh, has been uh, partially uh, thermally and photometrically protected, uh, we calculate that we basically would be able to maintain current climate uh, over the next century. So it basically, uh, correct. We can completely uh, rebalance the current uh, thermal imbalance that's driving climate change. If 10% um, of global cropland roughly uh, were covered progressively over uh, the remainder of this century. What really? Just 10%? Yes, order 10%. There's some, uh, uh, you know, the exact value needs to be demonstrated in larger scale experiments. Also coupled with the satellite observations, which uh, we do not have uh, the resource <laughs> currently to conduct. Mm -hmm. uh, but from um, evaluation of uh, basic uh, light transfer through the atmosphere and also uh, existing satellite data on shortwave uh, radiation downwelling upwelling, that's the expectation. Okay, and is this with, does this directly combat the part of climate change that is global warming or are there other, other benefits? Like do we, has, has your data shown that you see an increase in water production retention um, in areas in which you're testing these mirrors? Yeah, so on large scale, yes, the eventual goal is to stabilize the planetary uh, climate. But I, we have to emphasize that's a very you know, long-term goal over multi-decadal timescales. The most immediate benefits are local benefits of water saving. So we do have uh, prototypes that operate in different environments, including floating mirrors, uh, mm -hmm. which can be deployed, for example, in reservoirs mm -hmm. for agricultural usage, uh, uh, residential usage, but also pump hydro stations. Mm -hmm. So we'd have uh, preliminary data showing a reduction in evaporation rates uh, underneath floating mirror arrays. So these there are basically a lot of uh, co-benefits at local level in addition to the sort of unintentional global cooling benefit. What are the impacts that these mirrors have on ecosystems that you've seen thus far? We have not conducted a, a experiments directly uh, asking that question, um, but from a uh, just uh, reading the literature, for example, of the mechanistic causes for coral bleaching, it's mostly driven by thermal stress and heat waves. Mm -hmm. like, say if you're uh, two degrees over uh, their upper thermal limit for two weeks, so yeah. thermal dose of two week degree, um, then you can have large scale, you know, a bleaching of these corals. Yeah, and uh, our uh, water based experiments show that uh, floating mirror arrays can decrease water temperature in our test system by a few degrees on hot days, like four or five degrees. Oh, wow. And, um, uh, but first it also depends on the, the flow state of water in the field, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's also a paper coming out last year, um, just a few months before that shows during these heat waves, if you reduce the amount of light reaching the corals, they have a better chance of survival. Mm -hmm. Uh, so mirror essentially does both things. They yeah. cut it out a fraction of the light and also they buffer it against the extreme uh, temperature rises during these heat waves. So there should be a uh, you know, possibility for these uh, very targeted uh, protection intervention to preserve very important ecosystems. But surely we also need to study what the impact would be on local ecosystems, because as we're seeing increasingly the problem with the climate crisis and with every crisis is that so many things are interlinked. You know, you do one thing to help one part of the problem and you create a whole new problem. Um, given how fragile ecosystems are in the world, I would have thought that would be a priority to understand what impact these mirrors could have. Uh, correct, yes. So, and ecosystems are essentially driven by physical parameters, including temperature, uh, moisture, uh, light level, and acidity. So these impacts um, and how mirror arrays will impact them can be um, analyzed. 
Mm -hmm. the, for a lot of uh, primary production, um, the most severe uh, ecosystem stressors are temperature heat waves events and the resulting uh, lack of water drought. So these mm -hmm. are universally detrimental to primary production, basically plants. And that's true both for uh, trees and also crops, but also for uh, marine uh, phytoplankton. This is a slight tangent, but what do you think about the argument that um, techno-optimism or the use of technology deployed to directly combat the effects of climate change rather than combating you know, the roots of the issue, such as overconsumption, everything that you were discussing at the, at the beginning? What do you think about the school of thought that that just sort of perpetuates business as usual and essentially will only delay the impacts of the, the crisis rather than, than solve it? Um, I agree. And that's why perhaps uh, we started a conversation today uh, discussing about uh, uh, how society uh, is currently structured, you know, mm. incentivized destruction of the planet. And uh, in no way do we at mere uh, in the mere framework, think that mirror is a solution to the climate crisis. Uh, it's merely the cornerstone to hum humans surviving past the coming decades. Nothing, nothing more. Uh, and we also prioritize um, developing technology such that it's open source. Mm -hmm. and it's very exceedingly difficult, difficult because uh, funders who want, who approached us basically want to uh, use our technologies for profit, which we have mm -hmm. refrained from doing so because we understand clearly that uh, perpetuating the current uh, economic system uh, is futile in the end if your goal is really to give humanity a chance to perhaps accomplish um, miracles. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think uh, humans, uh, we are special in that we really are preoc uh, preoccupied by the, by the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's manifested from the individual level to societal level, like people are worried, worried about uh, how long they live and, you know, the quest for longevity is like, uh, what, uh, occupies a lot of, uh, say emperors and, uh, <laughs> leaders when they are in power. And, um, so at the societal level, uh, I think many civilizations think that they're unique and that they can persist for, uh, you know, m millennia and be the one that's really, uh, go to Mars and build a colony there. <laughs> but then, uh, if you uh, look at the data of uh, the longevity of civilizations uh, and of the dynasties, one finds that the longevity follows a log normal distribution with uh, the most probable age on this log normal plot being 230 years. And uh, our current fossil fuel civilization is basically around that age. And <laughs> I, I think evidence uh, is consistent with us being just uh, another of these civilizations. Yeah, of course. Uh, and I, I always find it baffling when, despite the millennia of evidence that you're bringing up, that people think that this will be the one that sees, sees it through for whatever reason. Although I do understand that on an individual level, it is extremely difficult to, um, how do I put this, despite our wealth of imagination, to imagine things being any differently, really. Mm -hmm. um, on the fossil fuel note then, how much energy does it take to create these mirrors or the amount that you would need to deploy around the world to cover 10% of cropland? Uh, you need uh, to invest 3.6% uh, of current energy consumption uh, to maintain uh, this planet. To maintain this planet, what do you mean? Uh, so the world uh, uh, consumes like about 20, uh, 20 terawatts of, of power. So you take um, three to four percent of that, uh, which is quickly like a, a roughly you know less than one terawatt. You use that energy to um, make uh, the glass and the mirrors and deploy them. That's roughly how much energy you need to invest. Okay, I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm I'm not a physicist, but I have had a couple on the show, and they have uh, explained to me that the energy available to us in fossil fuels is just so much more powerful than what we can do with electricity. Please correct me if I start rambling or I think that's probably correct. So the, the 18 or 20 terawatts of power refers to predominantly uh, fossil fuel energy in terms of heat that you burn yeah. by, jet, by burning it in oxygen. Uh, out of that, you convert a small fraction into electricity. So on the order of uh, a couple, Terawatt. 
Right. Okay. So we, if we're talking about how much electricity, that's a small fraction of what you can get from the heat. Um, and then um, both of these, you know, human powers using fossil fuel dwarf, are dwarfed by uh, the power that's currently heating the earth, which is at uh, 430 to 1,000 terawatts. Wow. So basically, it's a 50 times uh, mismatch between the problem that we created out there versus how much technical power we have available to address the problem that we've created. So the analogy that I like to use uh, when explaining the problem to people is that um, climate change and global warming is like cancer that we got while smoking uh, fossil fuels. But right now, it's not possible to cure the cancer by stopping to smoke because the problem out there has a life of its own. It's still going to grow and amplify heating that's locked in will certainly bring us past two, two degrees Celsius um, somewhere around 2045. And that's more or less independent of how we manage our emissions from now forward. Mm, that's interesting. So your argument then I assume would be that we have to devote research to technology that can combat this, this problem. It's not as simple as just stopping everything tomorrow and the world will sort itself out eventually. Uh, correct. There, there's no way to get out of, out of this by looking at the mitigation alone. And by uh, mitigation, I mean conventional definition of mitigation of only working on the greenhouse gas emission and capture side. It's just physically not possible. Mm, okay, I don't think I'd quite understood that before. So what kind of things do we need to be looking at then? What else do we need to be looking at? Because uh, there was a, there were a couple of reports recently about um, carbon capture technology and how like the emissions that it takes to create those plants will always um, outweigh that which they can actually recover from the atmosphere. So that uh, you don't really ever see anything hopeful about the technology that we're currently working on. Uh, carbon capture technologies are all intrinsically limited by uh, uh, both uh, the speed at which they can happen, mm -hmm. also how much energy they actually need in order to run. So currently you need roughly uh, to devote 10 years worth of energy to run the process to capture one year of emissions. Oh, right. Okay. So essentially at the current state, the technology is a, uh, excuse the word, a scam because it doesn't really do what it's publicized to do. It's doing more harm than good, uh, uh, when, you know, we're trying to capture carbon because the process is so material intensive and so energy intensive. Mm -hmm. So what direction do you think technology needs to go in? in addition to, to mirrors? Uh, I think it's uh, just return to uh, simplicity of how we live and uh, become more connected with the land. So we need the uh, you know, education of the, the next generation about reality that we're facing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to really um, teach how to, uh, as far as we can, you know, slow down the pace of life and um, um, just learn to avoid uh, heat emissions that there, there's a few like low hanging fruits out there that can be uh, uh, have a quite drastic impact. Uh, examples include um, car transportation, transportation by car, and also um, heating of houses. Mm -hmm. right? Like we talk about uh, airline emissions and the international shipping, but these um, are only like on the order of 2% of global emissions. Yeah. And in comparison, like, um, car transportation, it's on the order of 10%. But what can we do about those emissions that are locked in about that two degrees that we're going to hit in 2045? Oh, that, that's, that's why, um, some form of solar radiation management, such as using ground based mirrors are absolutely necessary because, um, um, essentially heat comes in as shortwave radiation from the sun. It gets converted into heat and stays a little uh, while on in the biosphere and then radiates out as long wave radiation. So greenhouse gases operate at the exit end, but that end is a very slow and recalcitrant. Uh, so the only way we can make an impact is on, uh, the input side of heat mm. so we have to intercept some of the, the light so that they don't get converted into heat in the first place. And when there's less heat to get rid of, then we essentially bypass um, the greenhouse gas long wave trapping mechanism. 
That's so interesting. Can you, the heat that you're directing away from the planet, can you also capture that as a form of, of energy? First of all, yes. And there are many companies working on that. And there, uh, recently, um, there was just a company uh, that's doing mirror-based uh, electricity and uh, heat production uh, uh, using some uh, basically uh, very similar ideas compared to some of the things we're developing. Uh, but uh, once again, like energy production is not the big problem that we're facing. We're really facing an ecological crisis mm. by um, excess uh, heat coming into the biosphere. And um, in comparison, you know, human power consumption, 18 terawatt, it's uh, completely dwarfed by the, uh, the, the thousand terawatt that's heating the earth. So the problem out there is way bigger than just the energy provisioning that we're trying to also solve on site. I find this so, 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 so interesting because of the way that the ecological crisis is so often framed, like, you know, the focus on on fossil fuels, which we, we just can't stop from one day to the next. Um, the lack, in my opinion, like the lack of attention on forests, which we could so we could stop deforesting one day to the next and it would have a huge impact. Um, but also this, like I've never heard the numbers um, put down in the way that you just have, you know, 18 terawatts of hu sort of human produced um, energy versus all of the energy that's raining down from the sun that's been locked in due to essentially, you know, not direct geoengineering, but the geoengineering that we've done accidentally um, since the industrialization and with a fossil fuel based economy. You hear about the sun being a source of energy um, and people wanting to harness it. And you hear about global warming, about that output, as you're putting it. The, the the end result of the impacts that we're having on the climate. But I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about the fact that the amount of heat raining down on us by that giant battery in the sun is an issue in itself and is something else that needs to be combated. Yeah, I think the, the lack of this discussion is a uh, very good illustration of the siloization of academia. So people mm. work on materials and energy, they basically just cite, okay, climate change is caused by energy. Therefore, we need to make energy more efficient and that's how they motivate their papers and uh, just get the write their proposal grants. And the very few, basically, like nobody, in my opinion, really, you know, took a step back and asked the question: Is becoming renewable, you know, going to be sufficient for addressing the the, the crisis? Uh, of course, in the past couple of years, it has been. Uh, there's more people uh, realizing and speaking in these terms. But you know, when we started to look on the uh, work on this topic in 2017, 2018. There was basically like no, uh, not really mention of this fact. Even even the conversation around renewable, what I'm hearing now interviewing ex experts is more the fact that we'll never be able to power the world in the way that we currently do using renewable energy. The amount of energy it takes to create renewables and rebuild them and blah, 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 blah. It's kind of a pipe dream. You know, we need to decrease energy consumption. So the, the critiques that are there are still always about, as you say, you know, energy. Um, never about these... How do I put this? What am I trying to say? Um, it's like when I've thought about the the ecological crisis and the the planetary boundaries, I've very much thought of the planet and haven't really gone beyond like the larger solar ecosystem that we're a part of that is equally impacting us every day. It's just not something I've thought of, and I think it's something a lot of people wouldn't have thought of because pre prior to us, um messing about with with how the world works the sun was such a intrinsic part of what makes life possible on the planet so you would just never think of it as um a problem yeah i mean because the uh nature has been so good to us in the past uh, you know uh, twelve thousand years and providing a, a very stable environment uh, and this constant back in our evolutionary history how is it that you got that you got onto the thermal problem it's a through uh, reading a lot of literature uh, just on the ecosystem and the agricultural uh, side of things. Uh, it's really just uh, through uh, learning what other scientists are doing and really uh, in going through thousands to tens of thousands of papers and synthesizing mm -hmm. that uh, collective learning by the community of uh, colleagues in different fields that we realized, oops, it's not really CO2 concentration per se. It's uh, really the heat that's generated as a result of uh, the initial perturbation in CO2 concentration that's really killing ecosystems and driving uh, adverse uh, climate events and extreme weather. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, it's a result of synthesizing the literature. 
And how is it being received in academia thus far? Are people excited about the idea? Um, I think that most people, uh, like colleagues um, who are scientists, hear this uh, the first time they got, yeah, they said, of course, it makes total sense. Mm. Um, uh, but of course, we have not really uh, um, put out uh, peer-reviewed publications yet uh, on the topic. Uh, these are still in writing because we're collecting um, still field data and working on data processing. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah. But at conferences and in private communications, it's been very well received. And um, who's funding you now that you've left Harvard? Uh, so we basically, you know, because uh, from the beginning, it's clear that we would only have two or three years to work on this maximum. And then COVID hit, then we lost a year of productivity. Yeah, of course. So uh, we were not even able to finish the first round of uh, plan experiment and write the papers. So um, we basically are um, just uh, giving the ideas out to different uh, collaborators and hope to uh, have the work continued in different laboratories. So we have been partially successful in doing that. Uh, we um, have a collaboration with uh, Plymouth State in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Several labs there are uh, participating in field research and also NHTI, uh, the community college at the co in Concord, uh, New Hampshire. And the recently we're starting a collaboration with a group in um, at, at Stanford to do um, continued um, measurement of water evaporation impact and water cooling using floating mirror arrays uh, because they have much better weather there compared to New Hampshire or <laughs> for that kind of research. Um, and there's al also like farmers and uh, um, people who reached out to us uh, wanting to collaborate. Oh, so really? we're also going to, you know, start a citizen science project, basically working with uh, concerned citizens. There's many retirees these days and um, uh, engineers and professors who are retired with grandkids who are concerned who want to join us. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, uh, funding is a problem because we're basically funding ourselves. So the group members, we have maybe 30, 40 people who are all volunteers and very dedicated. We donate our own money to, to the project. Wow, really? And is that is that because you, as you said, of, of few minutes ago, the, the ideology behind this is to have all of the, your data open source. So if you've been approached by funders who then aren't interested in actually giving the money when they realize it's going to be more difficult to capitalize on the results of your research. Um, yes, because they require, there would be like contract signed, you know, we wouldn't be able to really uh, disclose the, the technical innovations uh, to, to the public, which is not what we want to do. So uh, the fact that we're trying to do this, uh, develop everything open source and have data shared uh, uh, in real time in an open source manner is hindering progress because of the lack of the financial backing. Wow. Do you think that they could come a point where you need to get that financial backing and close the source of the, you know, make it a profitable venture for somebody just in order to be able to continue the research? Um, well, there are parts of the uh, the framework that are suitable for such ventures, including uh, uh, making distributed the solar energy capture systems that uh, individual household can purchase, and that would work much more efficiently than conventional PV, for example. So for selected projects, we're open to uh, such investments. Uh, but for the grand goal of uh, agricultural and ecosystem applications, I, I don't think... Uh, and Anyways, we have already shared the basic ideas. It's out there. <laughs> so I don't think it's patentable. So basically, uh, I don't think uh, investors would be interested in even, you know, spending money or funding it because it's already freely available. Yeah, yeah, true. What other issues do you foresee as this project moves forward? Do you think that the public will like it? Do you think governments will like it or, or not? Um, so initial applications include... Uh, as we mentioned, the safeguarding agriculture, but also alleviating urban heat island effect, especially in crowded regions mm. and areas. Um, for example, in India and the, in mm. the Arabian Peninsula, where um, wet bulb days, uh, temperature yeah. exceeding human tolerance are expected in the coming years to decades. Yeah. So uh, we have a bridge of uh, the MIR framework, uh, MIR Urban, uh, trying to uh, collaborate with uh, local universities in India to assess uh, the cooling impact of mirrored roofing against uh, other alternatives, including white roofs, uh, mm. concrete roofs, and metal roofs. Uh, so, but we're, of course, it's again, uh, totally humanitarian, uh, <laughs> you know, for non-profit purposes. 
I was actually going to ask you if it would be more useful for, for people to have solar panels on their roofs or these, these mirrors. Uh, it really depends on where you are. I think, uh, you know, if you're in very northern latitudes where most of the energy needs residentially is heating, then uh, for you, uh, local cooling is probably not something that's great <laughs> for you. But of course, uh, even um, using mirrors can also boost the efficiency of the solar panels when the whole system is properly designed. So oh, of course. it could be used um, but if the goal is for energy capture in northern latitudes. But um, for most of the global south where the major problem is overheating, then the cooling, the passive cooling benefits, uh, uh, you know, it, it's much cheaper compared to PV uh, to implement, uh, to bring about uh, some uh, measurable uh, impact. Mm. You said for those in northern latitude, the passive cooling um, probably isn't what people need. But would that not have a global effect anyway? Or is it is this solution very much tied to, to locale? No, implementing mirrors in everywhere on Earth would have a global cooling impact. Uh, mm -hmm. But the question is, when uh, when the project is so advanced that such a global impact becomes relevant, then I'm sure uh, climate scientists uh, in simulation uh, departments would have, uh, you know, investigated uh, the impact of different patterns of the implementation and mm. uh, their impact on global circulation patterns. Uh, so that's uh, something uh, in the future that will be very important for sure. Uh, just uh, in the short term, uh, from a adaptation point of view, um, mirrors can bring about uh, local benefits. Um, um, yeah, because uh, I think just making sure that they do not have unintended consequences, even on a local scale, is a priority. Yeah, yeah of course. And um, wh when do you think you'll be able to establish all of that? How long does that kind of research take? Um, so in this coming year, we'll be able to uh, say more about, uh, say, uh, the soil and air cooling impact of um, uh, medium mirror arrays on the order of a uh, few tens of meters squared um, as a function of uh, aerial coverage of the land by mirrors. And we'll also be able to say more about uh, soil moisture retention uh, as a function of the coverage. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And there's also one experiment looking at uh, uh, cooling of the apartment building uh, by putting a mirrored roofing on top. So I think uh, by this time next year we'll have most of the basic data to share. God, there really there really are a lot of benefits to that. Then, yeah, it, it's not it goes beyond crops. I mean, if you were to put them on the top of buildings as well, like yeah, in summer you can keep the heat down and people don't have to install air conditioning and then use energy that way and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. How interesting. It does seem still like quite an alien idea, though, the idea of like 10% of cropland being covered in uh, mirrors. There's something so futuristic about it. Uh, yes, uh, indeed. I mean, it's not a small undertaking. It's a mm. gigantic uh, uh, endeavor that mm. really takes uh, uh, global coordination, uh, you know, to, to be successful or to even, you know, merit a, a place in the discussion of how mm. to deal with climate change. But uh, from a energy um, needs, energy intensity and material intensity perspective, it's probably one of the most affordable and uh, uh, the most durable of proposals. Why the most durable? Uh, because uh, glass is extremely stable mm -hmm. and uh, it's 100% recyclable, uh, the designs that we're envisaging. So uh, let's say we were to implement this uh, strategy to temporarily stabilize the climate and uh, also complete the uh, energy transition to renewables, also using mirrors, you know, to boost renewable efficiencies, then greenhouse gases would eventually, you know, that decay over uh, centuries to millennium timescales as a result of natural processes. And as that happens, we need to retire the, the mirrors. Uh, what can we do with them? I mean, glass, you, you can just melt them and make them into construction materials or other structural materials. So it's a, a system that you can build now to tackle this climate challenge, but then over time you can then repurpose completely to other purposes as the greenhouse gas driver decays by natural processes. And how long will that take? Uh, the natural uh, decay takes 10,000 years to go to roughly 10% of the current levels. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah, that's uh, that's way beyond the 
uh, basically, if you look at the data of human recorded human civilizations, that's a uh, four to five standard de deviations outside of uh, the log normal distribution, which means it will never, you know, no civilization can last that long. Oh my God. Who knows? <laughs> we always want to believe you are special. 10,000 years. Do you think the mirrors could last that long? <laughs> um, the glass material, um, well, certainly last several centuries. Mm. I think there's uh, different uh, loss mechanisms, um, and that's very likely location specific. So mirrors that are in the path of a, a hurricane or a tornado certainly would, would be gone, uh, but there are locations uh, uh, where they would uh, you know, not be impacted by such events and that they can last for longer. So mm. variety of the loss mechanisms and the average time, lifetime of these devices can pre, um, conceivably be scaled to only order of uh, century, century, low number of uh, century time scale. Certainly beyond the decadal time scale because existing uh, solar mirrors have already demonstrated field lifetimes of 30, 40 years without some measurable degradation. So we know it's somewhere in the century time scale. Why put them on the ground? Why not put them in the sky? Uh, because of the uh, cost uh, for <laughs> launching them. Uh, right. so if one does, uh, uh, you know, the fuel cost analysis, one realizes that space-based methods are essentially never going to happen because we don't have enough fuel or material to support such an endeavor. Right. Okay. It's as simple as that. Yeah. It comes down to how much energy we have to work with as a civilization and how much heat we need to reject. So remember, the bare minimum is the energy rejected per energy invested of at least 50 times because that's the 50 times is the mismatch between global warming power and the, the total thermal power humanity has to work with. But of course, that's you know doing nothing but to make the infrastructure. And we need to eat, we need to house ourselves, heat our bones. So in the very optimistic event that we could somehow divert you know, 3 4% of our energy to tackle climate change, uh, then we need something that's much more durable. And I see. I'm not a numbers person. I'm still trying to wrap my head all the, uh, <laughs> the different numbers. Um, are there other people working on different kinds of um, projects that are equally cost effective and durable that you're really excited about and that, you know, you would like to see deployed alongside mirrors? Uh, so I think one, uh, so among the solar radiation management, management schemes, stratospheric aerosol injection is most prominently studied and highlighted. But uh, is this where they blast stuff into the clouds? Yes. Not into the clouds, into the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. um, but that um, that method, I think, is the uh, potentially the worst flavor of solar geoengineering to implement. The reason being that um, when you cut out sunlight so uniformly, uh, you also reduce the amount of uh, visible light available for renewable energy generation. Okay. Also for uh, ecosystem photosynthesis overall. So there's basically no spatial selectivity. And uh, thereby you impede the transition to renewables because uh, you make, you know, there's less light for mm. modules to capture. And especially when you have the nanoparticles scattering the light into different directions, light comes in not as a collimated beam that's straight from the sun to uh, the ground infrastructures. So many new technologies that operate based on concentrating solar technologies would uh, suffer on the order of 10 to 20% uh, decreasing efficiency uh, right. by the end of the century. So that's uh, one way to basically ensure that we stayed on fossil fuel path. path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the worst type that you can imagine. Um, the, but I am quite um, interested by marine cloud brightening technology. It's basically... Marine what, sorry? Marine cloud brightening. Okay. So the idea is that... Um, uh, these clouds are very white and the, they reflect sunlight, just basically the same as the mirrors. But the but marine clouds in the troposphere, they are uh, uh, first of all they're short lived. They live for uh, two or three days. So if some, something went wrong, they just rain down after a few days. So the ability to terminate uh, experiments that's one uh, good thing about the, the proposal. Mm. Uh, and the other is um, the proposal. I think is the most uh, promising. Is calling for an injection of uh, salt nanoparticles from the ocean itself uh, directly to see these clouds. So you don't have a, really a material uh, 
limitation problem there. Mm. You are taking the salt from the ocean, which is so large, it's barely making a, any difference. Uh, uh, so the flux of salt into the, the air that's required is a small fraction of what's sea spray and processes and hurricanes are already putting into the atmosphere. So there's minimal uh, atmospheric disturbance from a chemical point of view. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, quite promising. The difficulty, however, to, uh, for this operation is again one of uh, technology and energy cost. Uh, so uh, retired professor uh, Stephen Salter uh, proposes to use a wind-powered, completely wind-powered system. Uh, but the challenge there I see is uh, to do the mechanical design for the system and test it and perfect it. Uh, it's a multi-decadal sort of engineering challenge. Right. Uh, so how you get the energy to run the process and also the nanofabricated uh, droplet making wafers in order to inject uh, and to make these salt particles at a really high throughput and with a very high uniformity. That's something that just doesn't exist in the literature yet. So it's an open question whether the proposal is at all feasible from an engineering standpoint. Mm. But the, the intent, I think the ability to um, on demand, you know, cool a patch of ocean to, you know, alter or divert hurricanes and also to protect um, coral reefs, let's say, during a heat wave event. Events. These are very attractive applications. Uh, the challenge is one of the uh, feasibility of engineering and timing takes in order to make it uh, uh, energetically viable. There's a lot of talk, though, around um, geoengineering. We kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but that, um, yeah, without dismantling the current economic framework and our consumption rates, um, geoengineering is not the answer. Do you think that you've created a project with your team that even if you don't dismantle the current economic framework, um, will be beneficial over the next century, no matter what? Well, it depends on how what you define as uh, beneficial. Um, helping industrial civilization to persist uh, a few decades longer. Yes, that, that would be one potential impact. Um, but how do we, you know, define success or beneficial to humankind? And that uh, requires another discussion of how we measure success of this uh, organism. Right? So we already touched on the, uh, the concept, concept of time. We want uh, human life and human civilizations to last. So apparently uh, that's one maybe objective and empirical metric to measure success of uh, individuals and also different organisms, because what we call successful organisms are one that last for many millennia. Right? Mm. So time is one thing, but um, we also know that time cannot be just arbitrarily lengthened because there may be some statistical, you know, or, or it's just underlying mechanisms that can be seen from the statistics of the lifetime of different civilizations that limits how long we can aspire to last as civilization as individuals uh, before different things, including mutations, make us a completely different mammal mammalian species. Mm. So time is one thing, but that's not the only thing. The other is, I think, uh, in layman's terms, I think uh, satisfaction, life satisfaction. Or, um, um, and if we really want to be, you know, quantitative, we need to integrate, you know, the life satisfaction of every individual that has ever lived, uh, throughout uh, the existence of Homo sapiens. And if we use this aggregated, integrated measure of, uh, level of happiness, satisfaction over time for our species, then it becomes quite uh, clear that perhaps what we say that we call beneficial is to just improve the life experience of people um, over the remaining time of their uh, species and civilization. And the way to do that is to, uh, you know, distribute resource uh, broadly and dismantle the current, you know, money oriented uh, sort of you know, incentive structure and to decouple, you know, um, money from uh, the other things like power, status and popularity, which should be sort of like natural outcomes of uh, each of us engaging in something that really deeply passionate or we're diff deeply passionate about. So for politicians, maybe why do we need politicians? They're there to serve the people. So they're public servants, right? So, and in exchange for this uh, uh, privilege to serve and for artists in exchange for the privilege to provide art and be um, 
be known, perhaps they should relinquish some financial and monetary uh, advantage just to make it equal. So I think um, you know, we keep coming back to this, uh, you know, social engineering aspect. But in the end, if we define, you know, the success of the human race as a integration of the life satisfaction of every member of our species over the existence of our species from origination to extinction, then uh, that's what we should be considering and doing. What a beautiful note to end on. Lovely to, to hear that from, from a scientist who's working in geoengineering. Congratulations on keeping the project open source. I hope uh, more people fall in your footsteps. Yes, uh, me too. <laughs> Where can people find out more about MIRS? Um, because I'm sure everyone will want to, because obviously we haven't covered all of the, the tech and everything behind it. So most of the information are embodied in lectures that I've given uh, online and interviews I've given. Um, so we do have a website, but it's uh, quite rudimentary because we have very limited uh, uh, human power to really uh, maintain it at the current state. Um, but uh, if you're interested also in helping and in participating and becoming part of uh, the MIR framework, uh, you can uh, reach out to us. We do have uh, volunteer coordinators who will be uh, looking at your request and hope hopefully we can work together. Oh, fantastic. And then finally, who would you like to platform? I mean, these are probably people you know. Uh, have you heard of uh, Julia Steinberger? I am on it. Just, you know, uh, give another um, female uh, scientist that I respect uh, deeply, uh, Sabine Hossenfelder. She has um, a YouTube channel. She's like a theoretical astrophysicist. <laughs> or theoretical physicist. And then I, I'm sure she has uh, great things to say about, uh, you know, free will and meaning of life and... Uh, nature of the reality things like that fantastic Yi, it was such a pleasure speaking with you thank you for taking the time to explain mirrors yep like thank you if you want to learn more about mirrors i've put links to the website in the description box below remember to subscribe to this channel and share the episode if you enjoyed it if you loved it support planet critical on patreon the link is also in the description box below a huge thank you to the Planet Critical patrons and supporters without whom this work just wouldn't be possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.